Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India discussed uh, mechanical method for fabricating powders. Today we will look at some other method and the first method today that we will look at is electrolytic technique. So, it is simple electrolytic cell, you have a cathode and an anode. At the anode, the raw metal is dissolved. The raw metal probably will not be very pure and it will not be in powder state. But the powder, the, but the material that is deposited at the cathode is very pure one and second it is usually in the powder form. After deposition the cathode deposit is washed, dried, ground, screened and annealed to form the powder. So, it is uh, like you will see very soon it will be in a porous spongy form. It is like powders clustered together, agglomerated together. So, you can first take it away, dry it, ground it, screen it and then anneal it to form the powder. You are not really uh, doing any additional step to make it powder. It is not like that you have what you have obtained is a bulk material and then you are reducing to powder. It is actually already in very much close to powder state like I said agglomerated powder. Very high purity particulates can be obtained and like I also mentioned that in this method you will be able to get very high purity materials because the raw material that you may be using may have some contaminants, but depending on the, the voltage that you are using you may get only of that particular element that will be dissolved and then it will travel through the electrolyte to get deposited onto the cathode. Most common examples are palladium, chromium, copper, iron, zinc, manganese and silver. So, you can see this technique is much more useful for metals and particularly if you want high purity metals. Now, this figure on the right gives you a rough idea of how the particulates look like or how the uh, deposit looks like. So, this is a deposit that was obtained on the cathode and what do you see this may look like a big lump, but it is nothing but cluster or agglomerate of small powders. So, you need to just clean it, dry it and break it down. So, breaking down is just putting or separating the particulates together and this is a schematic of the system that is used to produce these powders. So, you have the anode where and you apply the voltage source, there is a cathode and in between these two there is uh, electrolyte. So, you use a system or, um, or uh, equipment so that you have lot large number of surface area onto which anode can be dissolved and similarly large amount large surface area for the cathode where the metal can be deposited. So, here you have another few more examples given Fe plus plus going into Fe, Cu plus plus going into C. So, these are the reactions that, can, that are taking place at the cathode side meaning they are getting deposited as solid form. On the anode side you had the bulk metal like iron or copper, so it gets dissolved. So, it becomes gets into the iron form. So, this is Fe plus plus, Cu gets to Cu plus plus and once it is in uh, this ionic form it can travel through the electrolyte which will be over between these two plates and then it will get deposited onto these cathodes. So, this is the very simple to understand technique although the setup may be a little bit more involved and you will get uh, powders like this. So, powder formed is often dendritic like we saw in the earlier image and sponge like in shape with poor packing characteristics. So, the powder particles that are formed or the agglomerate that you see it is not very tightly packed, it is very porous and with very poor packing characteristics and, in, and you need to do a lot of steps like cleaning and milling before you can make a powder which is usable for any compaction purposes. Particle size and shape can be adjusted to certain extent by controlling the parameters. So, you can change the voltage and current which are the main parameters in electrolytic cell to adjust the shape and size of the powder particulates. Porous powder like deposits on the cathode are favored by high current densities. So, if you go for high current densities you may get porous and powder like deposits. Low I, uh, so, this not only high current densities, but also low ion concentrations and acidic bath chemistries. Having looked at this method, what will your 
uh, thought be on making a alloy or a compound using this method? Can you make a alloy or compound? So, remember we are making from uh, material and we get getting it into the electrolyte in the ion form. So, do you think we can make compound? No, the compound cannot be made like this because in the compound you have a bonding between the two elements that will be formed and you cannot ensure that bonding just by deposition. However, if you are talking about alloys, in alloys there is no bonding on that uh, at the chemical level. So, if you are talking about alloys, you can actually do get alloys by eroding or by uh, depositing two different metals that you want to alloy. For example, let us say you are looking at Ni and Al. So, nickel and aluminum you can set the conditions or you can first dissolve them in the solution and then get it deposited and so you may have Ni Al layer. But this is also not a common technique for producing alloys uh, because even then you may not be able to get very uniform composition. So, making alloy is possible, but not usually done using this method. Apart from this, now we will move on to another technique, another set of technique rather I should say chemical fabrication technique and this itself uh, involves a lot of other sub techniques like we will see. Most of the metals that we see are fabricated into powder by chemical techniques. Some of the chemical techniques method are decomposition of a solid by gas for example, reduction of oxide and we will see an example on that. Thermal decomposition, decomposition of carbonyl compounds in the presence of catalyst into element. This is a very interesting method and we will see another example on this. Precipitation from a liquid, a dissolved compound such as nitrate chloride or sulphate can be chemically treated to produce a precipitate. So, you basically first dissolve or have the material in the liquid uh, dissolved solvent state in the into the solution and then change the condition so that a particular metal or the material or the for example, even oxide can be precipitated out and then you can separate out that uh, precipitation precipitates and you will and those will be most likely in powder state because it will again be taking place by nucleation and growth mechanism. So, the, uh, wherever that nucleation takes place there will be those small particulates and they will be at uh, different places and you will get small small powders at so many different places. And you can also have solid state processes meaning all the reaction is taking place in the solid state. There is no liquid state involved as in the other cases. So, let us look at the oxide reduction process. This process starts with purified oxide milled down to sufficiently small size. Oxide is mixed with reducing species. So, you what, uh, what you want is uh, for example, in this case you want to reduce the oxide. So, uh, for example, you want pure element uh, for example, of iron. So, you will get start with uh, pure oxide of iron reduce it and then you will reduce it. So, you will get pure iron and the method that you will use is such that you will be able to get powder size. So, we will see what is that. So, now this oxide can be directly exposed to hydrogen to cause reduction. So, we, what we want is reduction and for this reduction temperature is important from both thermodynamic and kinetic point of view. At a, uh, above a certain temperature oxides will be stable at a lower temperature the pure element will be stable. However, on the kinetics it is different for the kinetics higher temperature will imply higher kinetics lower temperature will imply lower kinetics. So, you have to find optimum condition of temperature where you are able to get reduced species or the uh, reduced material which is stable and at the same time the kinetics is high enough. Low temperature ensures minimal diffusional bonding of the product. However, low temperature processes takes considerable time for completion. Another, so, low temperature is uh, also desir desirable from the kinetics point of view because it ensures minimum diffusional bonding of the product. However, again the kinetics becomes low and then thermodynamics again the temperature has to play a role above a certain temperature oxide will be stable and below temperature the reduced species will be stable. Mostly sponge like structure is formed which can be crushed to get final powder. So, here is a diagram which explains the role of temperature and another pressure and also the pressure. So, for example, what we are talking about here is reduction of iron. So, let us uh, look at what is the usual equation for iron reduction. So, it will be of this form 
you will start from FeO which will be in solid state and you will react or reduce with hydrogen which will be in gaseous state and from here you should get iron pure iron which is in solid state and moisture. This reaction will be in equilibrium and you need to find a equilibrium constant and that equilibrium constant can be given by because the other two elements other two component, uh, components which is the FeO and the Fe they are in a solid state therefore their activity would be equal to 1 and therefore the overall reaction equilibrium will be controlled by the partial pressure of hydrogen uh, partial pressure of hydrogen and partial pressure of water or the moisture. Now in order to take the reaction to completion if you want that this reaction goes keeps going on what do you want? You want that H2O which is in gaseous state is continually removed. What will happen when H2O is continually removed? It will mean that this amount this particular factor is reduced and therefore to balance or to uh, bring the equilibrium the reaction will go into the forward state and therefore more and more FeO will get reduced into iron state. So this is uh, one way of making sure that the reaction keeps on going in the forward direction. You take away H2O, so H2 has to also reduce by the same amount and therefore H, uh, that will be possible only if it reacts with FeO as and therefore your reaction will keep going forward. So that is one aspect of it. Another aspect is explained by this diagram. Here you have on the y axis you have the pH2O by pH2 and on the x axis you have the temperature. So it shows for different temperature range what is the equilibrium constant or pH2 by pH, pH2O by pH2 where, where uh, iron is stable and where the oxide is stable. So this line over here represents that uh, ratio of the pressure, equilibrium pressure and for different temperature this amount is different and not only that for a particular condition you have FeO more stable, so this is the FeO stable, so at this particular if your pH2O by pH2 is and the temperature range is like this over here FeO will be preferred over Fe3O4 and this gives you a condition or this gives you the parameters that must be maintained for iron to be formed. So if you want the iron to be formed the temperature the pressure must be below this for example let us say we are doing it at 600 degrees Celsius then pH2 of our pH2 must be less than this pressure and only then iron will be stable and then you can apply it along with our second, second thing that we discussed that is to keep taking away pH2O that way you will have uh, this will ensure that the reaction keeps moving in the forward direction. So this is the technique of getting oxide reduction particularly in FeO and here is a micro graph which shows the powder particles obtained using this method and this is again as you can see a very porous structure of powder which has been produced by this oxide reduction method. So this is the oxide reduction method. Another aspect that you need to be aware when we are talking about uh, oxide reduction is that there is a reaction front. So let us say this is uh, our initial FeO powder. Now when H2 is it is exposed to H2 there will be a reaction front onto the surface and Fe will start to form. So let us say I use this. So this is the reaction front after some time this part has become Fe, porous Fe remember this will be still but this is inside it is still solid core solid FeO. At this stage if the reaction has to proceed then H2O must come out and 
H2 must diffuse in. So, these two gaseous species must diffuse at this boundary layer to ensure that the reaction keeps on proceeding and again this is why there will be a dependence on temperature that is the it is this the, the, uh, this kinetics that is dependent on temperature. If the temperature is higher, the diffusion of H2O coming out will be larger, H2 going in will be larger and therefore, the reaction will take at place at a faster pace. If the temperature is lower, then the diffusion will be lower and therefore, the reaction would not take place at a faster rate. So, it will take much longer time and this is explained in our next figure which is over here. So, over here on the right, you see the time that it will take as a function of temperature. So, what it says that as you keep increasing the temperature, let us say 800 degrees Celsius, it is taking for this particular condition, it is taking only less than 2 minutes to complete. Now, when you reduce the temperature to somewhere like uh, 300 or 400, you see that the time has increased. So, let us say this is somewhere around 250. So, time has increased to 8 minutes and below a certain temperature, let us say for example, in this particular case, it is 200 no amount of time is sufficient to get the reaction to completion. That is because diffusion becomes so slow that it is virtually, it has virtually come to a stop. So, when allowed to react freely in a closed container, FeO and H2 would react and proceed until equilibrium is reached provided we are providing it the uh, sufficient condition. For example, taking away H2O and also that the pressure, pressure ratio is maintained. We have answered this part of the question which is what can be done to keep the reaction going that is to take out keep removing the moisture. If you keep removing the moisture then the reaction will proceed in the forward direction because H2 has to be reduced by similar amount and that, that will ensure that Fe is formed. Since it is the original particle that is getting reduced what problem could arise with our reaction? We have seen this uh, since it is the original particle which is shown over here which is reacting. So, this was FeO and slowly it becomes Fe. It is not that for example, in electrolysis, uh, we had a new particle forming at a different place, but here it is the same particle we started with where reaction is taking place and moving into the front and finally, the whole thing has is supposed to become reduced and therefore, kinetics has a role to play or diffusion has a role to play and therefore, it changes with temperature and it, it also depends on phase change. For example, in this particular case, there is a different phase beyond this temperature and there is a different phase below this temperature and therefore, the total time taken there is a uh, step in this plot or the total time taken as a function of temperature. So, you can say that at this particular temperature and this, partic this particular temperature is uh, very suitable because here you are able to reduce the time as well as keep the temperature low enough. So, this may be a desirable set of parameter for this particular condition. So, this is the method of oxide reduction. Let us move on to still another method and we said we talked about uh, briefly thermal decomposition. Now, this thermal decomposition is a very very uh, interesting technique as you will see. Carbonyls are compounds that have very low melting and boiling points and are not very stable. For example, nickel carbonyl has a melting point of minus 17 degrees Celsius and boiling point of 43 degrees Celsius. Compare it with the melting point of nickel which is in excess of 1000 degrees Celsius. Similarly, iron carbonyl has a melting point of minus 20 degrees Celsius and a boiling point of 103 degree Celsius. In this process, first the metal which is usually not in pure state is reacted in presence of carbon monoxide to form carbonyl. So, you take the metal whatever it is. So, for example, nickel or iron which is not yet in pure state and then you form uh, are exposed to carbon monoxide so that you get this carbonyl. Now, you know that carbonyl will be a uh, very very low melting point material and therefore, it will be in vapor state. So, 
once you have formed that carbonyl which will usually be in the vapor state then this you cool down this carbonyl to liquid state. So, you will have to bring it down to for example, if you have made nickel carbonyl you will have to reduce it to 43 degree Celsius less than 43 degree Celsius. So, that it comes in liquid state and then at this stage again heat it in presence of catalyst. So, you will have to use some catalyst and then heat it again and what happens is that in this particular condition the carbon and oxygen or the carbon monoxide gets released and you are left with only the nickel compound nickel element and therefore, you will be able to not only get pure material, but you are able to get powder size of that material. So, you the steps are first you make the carbonyl compound at uh, by applying very high temperature and pressure, then you reduce it to below the melting point uh, uh, and then you again heat it in the presence of a catalyst. So, that it decomposes and forms that elemental powders. So, again uh, like electrolysis we are also be we are also able to do some purification here. So, very high purity powder of small sizes can be found using this method. Other metals like copper, chromium, platinum, rhodium, gold and cobalt are also processed using this method. However, there is some drawback that this method is very energy intensive. You need to first put high temperature and high pressure so that you can convert it to carbonyl and that requires a lot of energy and then again heat it uh, first bring it down to below the melting point then again heat it in the presence of catalyst. So, it is not a very easy to access method. However, it has several advantages you get purity high purity and second you get very small size powder. Let us uh, move on to still another chemical process and this is precipitation from liquid and one of the most uh, well known methods that you can say come that comes in this category is Bayer's method for producing Al2O3. Now, uh, in the bauxite which is the ore for aluminum there are Al2O3 and also some several other compounds. So, bauxite is dissolved in basic solution where only alumina dissolves. So, you, uh, you when you dissolve it in base only alumina of that whole bauxite gets dissolved and it forms ALOH hole 3. So, now this will be in first in a liquid state and in the liquid when you have it in the liquid state you will get rid of other compounds. So, you will filter out other and you will have ALOH hole 3 in a liquid state and then from this liquid state you will set the condition such that ALOH hole 3 forms precipitates out and once it precipitates out then you can again reduce it to form aluminum. So, let us uh, let me write down a little bit of uh, equation over here. So, we are looking at bauxite where and we have put it in a uh, basic medium. So, only Al o, uh, Al2O3 dissolves. So, let us say this has dissolved, this has dissolved and you have formed So, initially what you would want is that when you put in the bauxite in the basic medium it is in this particular state that is it is in the aqueous state and rest of the compound will be in solid state you will filter them out and you are remained with only Al OH whole 3 in the aqueous solution and that after that once you have filtered it out you will want the reaction to go forward. Here you will be able to precipitate out ALOH whole 3 and then you can convert it to Al2O3 and then A2 aluminum pure aluminum. Now, what is the method to control this reaction? This reaction if you write, so this is in solid state and therefore, uh, this does not, this, so this activity will be equal to 1. Now, if you want to write the forward rate constant for the forward reaction we can write it like this. So, this is the rate constant for forward reaction and this is a very small quantity is a very small number.
Now, if it is a very small quantity and you put this in base, or you add base basically what I am trying to say is if you add base it will imply that the reaction will proceed in the forward direction because if you add base then it would mean that this has become large and therefore this much reduce to a much smaller quantity and the only way for it to reduce to a smaller quantity is to form this and we will uh, just take a quick look at the numbers to understand this. So, if you add base reaction to almost completion for example, uh, let us say that k forward is uh, k forward is equal to 10 to the power minus 7. Okay, so, this is the quantity k 10 to the power minus 7 and now let us say that A L 3 plus to begin with is equal to 1. This will imply that O H minus concentration would be equal to 10 to the power minus 7 to the power 1 by 3. However, now let us say we add some base, so that O H minus becomes 1. Now, if O H minus becomes 1, so the product of this, but the product of these two should still be equal to 10 to the power minus 7 and therefore, it will mean that A L 3 plus should now equal to this 10 to the power minus 7 and this is O H minus cube equal to. So, the A L 3 plus just because you have added some amount of O H minus whose concentration initially was cube root of 10 to the power minus 7 and you have increased it to 1. So, the aluminum concentration reduces from 1 to 10 to the power minus 7 and how is that possible? The only way it is possible is by A L 3 plus getting converted of getting precipitated out as A L O H 3. So, this is a very powerful method to not only uh, get rid of other compounds that were there, but to also precipitate out and get powder size particulates. So, you will get A L O H whole 3 in particle size and then you can do some secondary operations to convert it to alumina. So, this can again be converted back to oxide by calcination to produce powdered oxide. So, you can get uh, powdered oxide out of it. Calcination results in a coarse particulate product. Precipitation from the liquid is uh, also used in many other methods. A dissolved compound such as nitrate, chloride or sulphate can also be chemically treated to produce precipitate. The idea is same, you always want to precipitate out compound or the element that you want in the powder form and since it is precipitating out, it will always be in very very fine powder size. Similarly, silver can be precipitated out of silver nitrate method and uh, so we can not only use nitrate, we can also use chloride, sulphate and some other solutions. There are several methods that are used to get particulates out of solution also. So, the precipitation is one thing, but uh, you can also use other methods to get the particulates out of the solution and two of those are called spray pyrolysis and freeze drying. So, we will start from this these two um, methods in the next lecture. So, we have looked at some of the precipitation from liquid method, next time we will look at how to get from uh, get precipitates or particulates out from the sol solution and the two methods that we will discuss are spray pyrolysis and freeze drying. So, we will continue our discussion on powder fabrication in the next lecture. Thank you.